Sunday I was from my sister who was a speaker tonight. Um, I haven't done any talks for quite a few years in my field of editing and so on. So you have a ten pound course. And now I'm even being recorded. <laughs> so that makes it double the thing. Yes, I'm going to criticize for speaking a little soft tonight. So I'll try to be a little bit louder. Um, so what made me to put my hand up? I'll be interested, and please just double checking that everybody has this copy of this. So that way you can follow my talk. not publications, copies of, for example, prescribed burning criticized by Aboriginal elders. Uh, I also brought a couple of CDs there. Of course, I've got quite a few at home. Now, that CD is called Fuel Reduction Burning Facts and Myths, and it's written by me. And I did it about 15 years ago. I've been interested in fuel reduction burning for 20 years plus because with two eyes, I could see a lot of the disasters that are actually happening as a result of it. So I've been working on it, I've been up with hundreds of uh, documentary photographs, and 15 years ago I put that together, and of course it's what I see, because then that was the technology of the day, no longer is, and some of you probably can't even read it anymore because your computer probably doesn't even have a CD drive in it anymore. But then, there they are in this kind of state, and other people who are interested are going to email it because after that it used to be a large file of like 35 megabytes or something like that. But I had it reduced to something like 3 megabytes, so I can email it. So if anybody's interested in a copy of that, I can email it. You can have a copy of that article, prescribed and criticized, and also there are just a few, few sheets of a diversity which occurs in, in the forest where I live. Now, I live in a small township of Quinina, which is about 30 kilometers south of Manjima. So it's Kerry Forest, Jara, Mary, Blackbutt, Occasion, Megacarpa, and of course it's got a huge diversity, providing it's not built. Now, the forest that surrounds my house, it's actually on my property, um, is, um, has been burned for 37 years. When I bought the property, it was 22 years, I left there now for 15, so it's 37 years has not been burned. So I just very quickly this morning put together that list just completely for memory. I, I apologize, I did not have enough time to prepare. I had a day week last week, I was injured, and it's a bit of a miracle that I'm here today actually and walking because my last week I just not do anything without crashes. So it's a bit of a miracle. But I put it together this morning, or uh, some of it yesterday, etc. And I also apologize, in that piece of sheet I just gave you, which is a little bit like index, um, there are a couple of titles in there, and a couple of sentences that I need to rephrase a little bit better. They don't sound terribly good the way it is. Um, okay, now, fuel reduction burning facts and 15 years ago, I sent it around, and it was not back predominantly by new boroughs. And he knocked it back rather bluntly and he sent me some of his information which I disagreed with and I replied to that and he simply and I gave him questions. I actually analyzed some of the things that new boroughs was uh, was uh, insisting on and I actually questioned and analyzed it and he just never replied after that. So I, I just lost the uh, uh, lost the inspiration and the energy to do it, to, to, to continue with it. It has been on the web page of the Wayfarm, WA Forest, uh, Forest uh, Association, and uh, a lot of people supported it in private, but publicly I didn't get anyone with it. Last year, 6th of June, was a very special day for me because I attended a forum in Margaret River that dealt with that problem. And there were scientists from all walks of life who were actually strongly criticizing the fuel reduction burning. And that just gave me new inspiration and new energy to continue with it. 
and this is why I put my hand up to try to revitalize the opposition to it and, and the knowledge about it and to fight and that predominantly this is my main problem. I would like to find a better way of dealing with extra fuel. Of course, I don't like use, using the word fuel because it's the regrowth, it's not fuel. But it's too much of it. The reason why it's too much of it, and I will be presenting some photographs, is actually as a result of fuel reduction burning. Why we have too much undergrowth and too thick undergrowth, and why we are losing biodiversity, etc. So I'll be presenting in a minute. And at that forum, I met David Knowles. Of course, I met him here years ago. And I, I, I knew David, and I was so pleased that David was actually one of those presenters there in the Arena. And his presentation was just out of this world. And that really spoke a lot of sense and a lot of logic. So that again inspired me. Uh, there was also Don Bradshaw, Professor Don Bradshaw, at that, uh, at that uh, migrant uh, forum, and uh, his, he, he back again was strongly criticizing a few reaction burning, and he said comments, which I've been saying as well, burning has become a business, and that's unfortunately what it is. Um, and the only thing that disappointed me at the forum, and I was kind of waiting for that and hoping for that, that there will be discussion about what to do with the extra regrowth in the forest. Because we do need to handle that, because we don't do anything about it. The forest, especially the wild fires, will simply become too hot and the damage from wildfires is quite, quite, uh, quite uh, huge and we can't do that either. So this is why I've been uh, working on it and I do offer, hopefully, I offer some solution here. Now, when we talk about uh, uh, forests, forests should be full of life. When you walk into a forest these days, the forests are lifeless. I'm sure that you all know this. Apart from few birds, few black cockatoos, uh, few kangaroos, etc., flying in flying animals or flying insects and big strong animals. Um, but otherwise, even if you go to park these days, I believe that 70% of numbers have been lost due to prescribed burn. Not a wildfire, a prescribed burn. 70%. That was publicized. But unfortunately, I haven't had the courage. I'm a little bit far from there. But I haven't had the courage to go and look at it yet. It just devastated. If you put your mask down, so you put your mask down. I'm sorry, guys. I've no idea. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's all right. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not going to take any more. Um, so, just showing a few insects, because this is an insect study society, so I've been trying to so focus on insects a little bit. All of those are slow moving insects. They are flying insects. And 100% of those will be lost. I inspected several fires in Manjuna district. One of them was in Mercia Forest. They burned two and a half thousand hectares in one hit. They call that mosaic burning. Mm -hmm. So this is why, why something has to be done. Because some of those claims, like for example, it's on the sheep, burning for biodiversity, burning for silviculture, they're just absolute nonsense. They're killing 100% of insects. How can they be called a burning for biodiversity? I just don't understand that anybody can make such a statement. Or burning for silviculture. They don't seem to know what silver touch is all about. Silver touch is about singing and pruning, not about burning everything. Reducing fuel loads and dangers of wildfires. So I have to progress these few photos. There are a few more insects that are totally wiped by a few natural birds. These are ground dwelling insects, they are absolutely magnificent insects. And of course, all of these are photographed in my forest, by the way. All of them. All of these photographs here. If you walk to a forest that's been burned, even two years ago, you'll be struggling to find a single one of those. You'll be struggling. You're certainly not a year later, like I've inspected all of these areas that were burned recently in Major District, and there was thousands and thousands of hectares. They are absolutely dead. You will only find a few ants and few birds that fly through. But there's no food for anything anyway. 
a few of these uh, uh, soul moving insects, a few more of those. Uh, that is a moth, for example, that specializes in hakeas. There are two or three different hakeas, and those, those uh, caterpillars that you saw before are actually from that moth. A stick insect, all of these slow moving. I'm not a few other insects there as well. Obviously, the rubber fly, a very strong flyer. So there's a chance that, uh, a very good chance that an insect like that will survive, but they will not return because there's no food for them. And again, a few slow ones. Uh, there's that uh, uh, bee fly, a beautiful, beautiful creature uh, feeding on the nectar. Uh, and that uh, a bee fly could also be. Uh, vulnerable because it spends a lot of time on the ground actually. When it feeds on the eucalyptus flowers or on the zentaria, then it's, it's okay, but it sp spends a lot of time on the ground too. And that little bee is vulnerable because it uh, makes, uh, makes nests in, in, in little, little uh, hollows that were left by some uh, long beacon beetles, for example. And of course, a lot of that gets burned. Now, we go back to burning for biodiversity. This forest, which is on Muir Highway, corner of Muir Highway and Deeside Road, has been burned twice in the last 15 years. What can you see? That most eucalyptus, you can also see that there's a pine that survived, there's a pine there. You can see that some sensitive trees are there. Uh, you can also see enormous infestation by Acacia bilbata, which is eastern state species that unfortunately is doing rather well in WA. And like most Acacias, they are actually, when there's a fire, they, I wouldn't say they love it, not like love it, but the, the germination of their seed is much more successful after fire than it is normal. That seed from Acacia derbata or Acacia melanoxylon will germinate under normal circumstances, but it will germinate much more profusely after fire, which is why you have these enormous thickets. All of these, all of these here, that's all Acacia derbata. It's it's basically you can't you can't walk through, you can't penetrate. It. That's how thick it is. So it's quite obvious that that forest now is after 15 years is far more flammable than it was before the field Russian burns. So reducing fuel loads and dangers of wildfires is not achieved by fuel reduction burns. Stimulating germination, well I just said it, but unfortunately it stimulates germination too much and often of non-desirable plants. The one that you'll see next Ah, sorry, that's another one. This is the germination of the typical forest of today. And you can see that, you can't see because the photos are not of high quality. Uh, you can see this, for example, you take to Samaria. You can see that it's dead, but you can see about eight suckers coming at the bottom. So that forest after the burn, and that's, by the way, this is probably about a year and a half after the fuel actually burned. So you can see how quickly that coppice will actually develop, and the forest is much thicker again. So it is the opposite to what silviculture should be, the absolute opposite. Uh, this is the one, this is Hakea angulata, which is a very common Hakea in Jara and Kerry forest of the whole southwest, probably all the way from I'm guessing a little bit here, probably all the way from Jerobin to Albani. It's, it's a really very common health care. And I have it from my farm as well, but not in these thickets. Now, there was just one plant there. This is in Koyal Group. There was just one plant, or maybe two. And as you can see, there's quite a lovely mature plant. But after the fuel reduction burn, there's about 100 plants now. Now, not only these plants will be chunking each other because they can't all succeed, 
but eventually there will be certainly more than two. Let's say 20 will succeed and continue learning, and that's too many. So that's again making the next fire, whether it's a fuel reduction burn or whether it's wildfire, it's always going to be hotter than without uh, having these fuel reduction burns. I'm sorry I switched it off, or do I don't know. I accidentally switched it off. Thank you. <laughs> now, they're talking protecting life and property. This is Margaret River. This is about 10 years ago, I can't remember exactly. Actually, there's a date there, maybe. No. This is a photograph of a, of a paper article, a newspaper article. And it shows that it is not the forest. This is not the forest that burned. That's not the forest that actually caused the fire and caused those houses to burn. These were mostly peppermints, just thickets of peppermints. Now, those peppermints should not have been there at all. We should have just a few nice trees, sweet trees, just for lovely habitats, for pleasing the eye, etc. We should not have these thickets of peppermints. Those peppermints should have been thinned. Everybody in the southwest, including us, we have a problem with peppermints. We have to control them. We don't allow the peppermints to become such thick thickets. Thick, thick. So it's not a rocket science. It can be done. And we do it, my wife and I, and occasionally I have some, some local helper, uh, and we just do make it. And peppermints, believe it or not, make fantastic firewood. And you don't have to chop them because they're not the right size. <laughs> so you just cut them and you just use them as firewood. Fantastic firewood. <clears throat> again, I'm done again, but I don't want to now. Now, this is Kerry Forest. Now, I'm, now we went through those. Now, hang on. I, I'm, I'm ahead of myself, so take it away. The next one is creating a, a, another claim that a burning lobby, I call it burning lobby, and as David, David calls them burns. <laughs> Which I can always call first wave burns. First wave and second wave, that's right. That's right. And, and alcohol is fantastic, really. <laughs> it's perfect, perfect way to do it. Um, so, they also claim that burning creates fertile energy. Now, that's another Hold of earth, it's just absolute nonsense. Because ash has no nitrogen, zero, zero nitrogen. Ash has a tiny bit of potash and a tiny bit of phosphorus and calcium. So it cannot be called for, for the, that it's like fertilizer. What they do by burning all that, all that leaf litter, all that decomposing leaf litter, that is actually the food for the forest, for the trees, and for the forest dwellers, the insects, the animals, etc. Uh, so, I have a huge problem with that statement. I just do not know how they can actually say that. And another seven on their plans is that forests evolve with fire. Another first. If you ask Professor Steve Hopper, he will tell you that the forest in the southwest evolved between 10 and 12 million years ago. Aboriginal people arrived approximately 60,000 years ago. I wouldn't say that Aboriginal fire that they used fire, of course they did not burn Gary for his name, but that's another thing. Um, that Aborigines presence in the southwest made any changes or any important uh, uh, participation in evolving of the forest. Because that, could, that actually happened between 10 and 12 million years ago. So what actually happened probably that during the era of Aboriginal people, we probably lost some species that we don't even know about. And the trees that survived, which is why so many Australian trees and plants have uh, a lot in Cuba. Because the ones who did not have it probably did not 
of iron that was for them. Nobody knows for sure, but there's a good chance that this is why David was the first wife on Thomas. And then, of course, the protecting life and property. Now, we move on to what, what I play. And you already know what I play because I still keep jumping a little bit. Uh, I claim that burning reduces biodiversity and changes natural balances in both fauna and flora. I've already demonstrated how it changes biodiversity in fauna by basically indiscriminately killing all slow moving insects. It just wipes them out. And it takes years and years and years before they recognize. Particularly when we are burning such huge areas, I mean 2,000 hectares. Recently there was a bird uh, uh, near a lake new. And they actually themselves say, I don't have to drive around it and measure it like I did with some of the others, but they actually claim on, on their webpage 4,000 hectares. Now this is absolutely crazy. This is, this is mad. Um, so, this is fairly normal, what you see today in the Kerry Forest. Few striking hairy trees, because obviously this forest has been blocked. I don't know if it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But you can see few struggling trees which they left, which is sometimes they call as seed trees. The rest, everything else is Gary Hazel, Tremali, Tremali and Florimali. Gary Hazel, Gary Hazel can be five, six meters tall and it can be so dense. Again, you cannot walk through it. It's impenetrable. And this is what we get these days. My second point is, burning is directly harming and killing vast range of flora and flora. Again, I've already demonstrated that with insects. But let's have a look at the flora. There was a fuel reduction burn in Kuna, where I live, not far from where I live. And immediately after a fuel reduction burn, and it was a fuel reduction burn, it was not hot. It was, as you can see, there's still green foliage everywhere. There's green foliage there even. There's some sponge foliage here. I carried quite a few. You would be surprised how many carry trees actually fell down. This one had to be cut down because it was deemed to be dangerous. So they came with, with a chainsaw and some of them they just pushed over with bulldozers. Again, I do not know how can anybody do that. They can see the enormous damage the fuel reduction burning does. But they're quite happy to bring bulldozers and loggers and chainsaws to cut some of those trees that were damaged to such an extent they had to be cut down. And some of course totaled without any help. So that happened in pretty much. And again, a little bit later on, you will see a photograph five years after this, and you will also see that now the fuel situation is worse than it was before the fuel, fuel reduction burn. We go to point number three, that I claim that fuel reduction burning is destructive, it kills thousands of mature and senescent trees, and in no way resembles Aboriginal cultural burning. Now, it, it's been said many times that Aboriginal people did mosaic or hatch burning. Now, what we do today, of course, has absolutely nothing to do with mosaic. Uh, if I, if I ask anybody what that means, they will say, okay, a few acres, maybe a few hectares, but not 2,000, not 4,000. So this is what we get today. Uh, quite a quality dry forest near Manjima. It's, it's called, uh, that is called the Diamond State Forest near Manjima. That tree, and I know the forest quite well, that tree did have a scar already, probably from some fuel reduction burn 10, 20 years ago. But when this second burn went through, they actually didn't quite kill the tree, actually killed the tree, but didn't topple it. They came, they, they mined the tree, as you can see, it's been marked, and they actually had to cut it because it was being dangerous, too close to the main road. So they actually cut it down. The same forest, the Diamond State Forest, is here. Exactly nine years later, as you can see, the fuel is very, very thick. And as you can see, trees are still dying today. 
The reason why they are still going today that all these bulldozers and loiters and fires actually change the soil structure and change all those uh, all those uh, uh, important elements in the soil that the trees need to survive. So they're still dying today. That tree tried very, very hard to survive. It sent out some epic warming shoots, but when a tree sends out epic warming shoots, that's usually the end. That means two years later the tree will die. That's just the last some sort of defense mechanism the tree has, and it sends out the people shoes, but it usually doesn't work. The tree usually does not survive. I also claim that no form of burning is currently suitable as our forests are in a very poor state of health and that the structure has been seriously altered by many years of overlogging and burning. So even if the burning was remotely useful, because we changed the structure of forest so dramatically, I claim that the very far is not the way even Aboriginal people did it, we should not be doing it. Because we've changed everything so much, so drastically, that far is no longer an appropriate way to even, to even consider. Now let me have a look at the other photos. Uh, there's another photo. This is a photo of Red Tingle, you go to Chicksoriae, and there's two on this photo. This is in Walpole, the location of that is called Pedro Fire Line. And you can see there is a scar there, and you can see that tree burned out completely at the bottom. I have a detailed photo of it, but I try not to bring too many. I've got about 26 slides, and I think that was one. Um, but you can see the tree is already dead. And when I went there in later, it was down on the ground. This one is still standing. It's alive here, but it's now dead as well. And it's got a huge scar there. And on the right hand side, that is again from Quinn up, a tree which they had to cut. Another tree they had to cut. Now, a bit of a shot. This is what forests looked like. By about 1900s. This photograph was taken around 1900, 1902 or something like that. This is the Injara region. This is Margaret River region. So I assume this could be dwelling up here. The, the photograph just says the Injara region. Um, you can see, or just come down, you can see people on the horseback there. You can see people already getting stuck in one of them. And of course, you can see here people already chopping them down as well. It's partly understandable. And if that sort of logging was going on for 100 years, that people take out one or two trees per hectare very, very carefully, the logging or the, or the, the forestry or the timber industry could possibly still survive. But because we are just doing it in such a drastic way, just basically clearing everything uh, and just taking far, far too much out of the forest, then again, we did. It's, it's basically greed and it's like just trying to take too much for nothing. But this is what forests look like. If you look at the photos, you can see the, the trees are, on average, twice as high, much thicker, much bigger. And you can see there's virtually no undergrowth. You don't have thickets of shibali for rebundance. You don't have thickets of peppermints. You don't have blackberries and all that sort of stuff. So it's a completely different. If forests still look like that today, you could possibly do a little bit of field grass and burning if necessary, because that would not hurt those beautiful trees. All of those trees would be probably somewhere between 500 years old, up to 1,000 years old. Jara trees, not carry trees. Carry trees live up to about 400 years and they grow much faster. They don't live to this and all the same. But Jara tree can live to 1,000 years. <coughs> uh, point number five that I claim that fuel reduction burning is counterproductive as fuel actually increases to the above previous levels in a relatively short time. Again, already kind of demonstrating that anyway. But I'm going to get in a bit more of the detail. In Quinina, this is Kerry Hazel. This was burned 
I don't know what that's meant when. It was very really recent. And you can see there with some of our candy, I think, about the stems of Gary Hayes. There's just a little patch. And that could have been controlled with the chainsaw if, if somebody wanted to get rid of it. Could have been controlled with the chainsaw in five minutes. 20 steps. No, I had to burn. And if you look at the regrowth, the fire actually helps to regrow it because obviously this plant likes fire, likes heat. There's about over 100 now. There was 20 now, it's over 100 little, little sapling plants. And they will grow to maturity, yes, because they are very thin and spindly and they will continue growing. And this is why you get this enormous thing that you cannot penetrate the kind of walk And you can see it here. So this is after about, after about four months after fire. This is five years after the fire. And you can see how dense it is. And unfortunately, that's a really bad thing for us. Because Trinario Foribana has very shallow roots. It takes up all of those nutrients at the top of the soil levels, it takes it up. And the trees are actually struggling to get nutrients because it gets taken by the fire, first of all, it gets turned into ash. And then when the carry hydro regrowth takes up anything that's left in the soil still, it just takes it up. And the trees simply don't have any food. This is why the trees are looking so very, very unhealthy. They're just along Mandabidi cycling track. I used to cycle there quite often. I know the track well. I know the forest well. And now it's difficult to cycle because the carry hazel now is actually even going across the road. So it's very hard to cycle there. They just completely and totally knock it up. Completely. It used to be a bit of forest. It's called the Doraga National Park, by the way. Corner of cleaning up just corner of the Wheatley Coast Road and Southwestern Highway. Doraga National Park. And there's been one that we need to buy And it is completely, completely destroyed. Point number six. I mean, that's quite obvious. Emissions reach thousands of tons of CO2 and thus contribute to warming of the climate. And this also contributes to the forest poor health and hotter fires. I mean, that's a pretty obvious thing, but I don't think I have a photo to prove that. <laughs> okay, the next photo. Burning also changes soil structure and pH. The soils become less fertile. I already touched on that as well, but I'll be previous I was talking about the ash. I didn't speak about the pH. Ash is highly alkaline. And anybody who does a bit of gardening knows that alkaline is bad in your garden. Your pH in the garden should always be around six, six and a half. In some plants like farm. But if you, if you put ash on your plants, it will kill them. Because it's just too alkaline. If you buy potting mix by brownies, I hope this is not going to get me to some sort of commercial track. Because potting mix by brownies, the alkalinity or the pH, I should say, is eight. Nothing will grow, nothing. You put a little ceiling in it, it will die. So, that's another thing about the fact that the burning will be claimed is that ash is fertile. It's just the opposite. It's a killer. Burning is also very wasteful. And it, at the moment, in a minute, I'll get into a bit of trouble because unfortunately I changed the order of the photos because as I, as I explained before, I had to be in a bit of a hurry. And what I actually have on my printout and there is entirely different now. But I mean, the photos speak for themselves really. So even if I put it down a bit out of order, you can see the photos speaks. There's another one that, that was the film reduction man, totally unnecessary by the way, two and a half hours like that. Uh, as you can see, there, was, there were no bushes, there was nothing, the bush was very sparse, there was no need to burn it at all whatsoever. But because it was burnt in April, in other words, at the end of summer, the trees are extremely vulnerable because they don't have enough moisture, they are dry, the thing is dry. And if there's any injury to the bark or to the tree, the fire will enter and it will burn and burn. 
and they set it on fire, and then when they think that it's not burning vigorously enough, they leave it. They leave, leave it to completely burn out. They should be there and check hosing some of these burning trees, hosing them down, so those trees cannot burn completely and will not topple. And this is what happened. I counted 200 such volcanoes in these 12,500. And of course, I didn't know all of it, by the way. But I found 200 spots like this in the two and a half thousand hectares. The trees needlessly, needlessly killed. Um, because just firing. Uh, because the spacing is quite wide, I didn't measure it, I didn't even know that I was too upset. Um, it was probably when it ended up as fence posts. But normally it ends up as firewood and it gets sodden in these lions, lions wood reference, I think they call them. Lions wood reference, they're all the time in that one. So this is where they get the timber. And a lot of it is, this one is not, but a lot of it is only eight mile timber that we should be making furniture out of, exclusive furniture out of. Um, if, I mean, it's unfortunate something like that happens, and I will show you another one. Okay, this is on my farm again. This wasn't bullet. When I bought the farm, we walked through. Some patches of the forest were quite quite rough uh, because it has been unattended to for many years, but it has been unburned, so it was quite virgin. You can see that everything is a little bit thick, and I'm still working on it. So it's a work in progress kind of thing. Keeps me fit. But actually, last week you didn't. <laughs> and um, I discovered there was a quite a sizable jarrah that just died of natural death. And I said to myself, it's a, it's a waste if it just sits there. Of course, it would be habitat for some bite. It would be habitat for some animals, possibly, once it rots a little bit more. But I thought I was in the process of building out. And I asked to myself, well, this is just easy. Uh, and rather than me going to Bunnings and buying wood, why should I go to Bunnings and buy wood when I have wood in my forest? And I hired these, these two guys from Angela with a portable mill. They cut it up for me, and I built half of the red it. And all the other tracks, window frames, door frames, were made out of this jar And there's another one. When we bought the farm, it had to have a fire break, it's a legal requirement. This huge tree is blade bark, more than a meter in diameter. That tree was ring bark, not burnt, but ring bark. It used to be the practice of the old days. If you want to get rid of a tree, ring bark it, it will die and it will die. That tree toppled before we bought the farm, and when we, when we bought the farm, we found it like this. Underneath is two carrot trees. And those two carrot trees, and as our neighbor told us, this, this happened roughly 10 years before we bought it. So this is probably 60 years old, and it was too, too, too rotten, and we could not use it for anything but farm. Mm -hmm. But these two carrot trees, luckily the termites didn't find it, because probably most of you know, the termites love Gary. That's their favorite diet, Gary trees. And you wouldn't expect it because Gary trees is very tough, very hard wood. But for some reason, termites love it. So if you leave a piece of Gary anywhere in the garden, the termites will find it and, and just gobble it up in no time. Luckily, they didn't find this. I don't know why. But what, some other piece of wood around the farm far when I was building, like around some floorboards, <laughs> they find it and come stuck it. But luckily, they didn't find this, it was sitting there for 10 years. So again, the same two people that you saw in the previous picture, uh, they milled it for me. Um, obviously, we have to cut them one at the top first, remove that one first. Then we go down to the scary trees. And again, I use it on the veranda only. You can't use it anywhere where the tree touches the ground again because of the termite problem. So, this is what I think. If I put fires through that forest, all of them would be lost. Apart from additional damage, that all this stuff, which I reckon is usable stuff, and I, I don't think it's wrong to actually use it like we did, because if I didn't use it, I would have to go and buy it. So I would, the timber would still need to be cut somewhere. 
Um, so I, I used it like that. I think it's just a sensitive way of doing it. Before you burn anything, you've got to inspect it. If you see lots of trees with scars and injuries, you have to protect them. You have to hose them down before you start the fire. Or you have to rake all the stuff away from the tree. So because that's where of course it is. Around the tree, as you will see on the next few photos, bulk of the fuel, which we call it that, it's not really fuel, but let's say we call it fuel, is around the trunk of the tree. So that's the hottest section of any fire. And because it surrounds the tree, there's a very good chance that even trees with reasonably thick bark, such as Mary, such as Jara, such as Kerry, that will actually penetrate the bark. And especially if the fire is so late in the season, like at the end of the summer, the trees are struggling for moisture, it will burn the trees off. And if, if nothing else, it will produce a size of injury. Now this is from Northcliffe, a fairly lovely spot for the cathedral tree. It's a, it's a uh, cherry tree, you can use the versicon. Cherry tree quite large with burnt out trunk. It's been standing there and protected for many years. Therefore it's still standing because obviously some people discovered it and cleared around it and made it and turned it into a tourist attraction. But a lot of tourists used to visit it. I visited it for the first time about 30 years ago. Somebody put in it. And the ruin was lovely. And there was no carry hands at all. You could see the tree from a distance. You could walk through it. You didn't need to follow any sign because you could see it from a distance. And it was a really lovely area for just for photographing, for enjoying, for camp camping, whatever. Now, of course, we have two uh, fuel reduction burns in those 30 years. I don't, don't know the dates exactly of my life. And look at it now. The tourists will not come. So this is actually going to, this is, people said to me quite recently that accommodation in Bermuda, the start of the year is totally booked out. It was booked out for December, but then plenty of vacancies in January, and they couldn't understand why. And I told them, I said, listen, this is hard, because the fuel reduction burning is actually destroying tourist industry. Because who wants to go and, and see that sort of thing? You walk in a tiny little, you have to walk like sort of a, like a kind of a duck arrangement, one after each other. You can't even walk side by side because the track is too narrow. Because it's just going through the very hazel forest. And you can't see anything. You will not find an orchid in there. You will not find uh, Brevilia there. You will not find Hagia there. You will not find anything there. Just carry hazel. Not even bracken. You will not even find bracken in there. That carry hazel because it's got these shallow roots, just takes all the nutrients from the soil and grows in these 20 centimeter intervals. So just that thick, it's impenetrable and it kills everything. It smudges everything. Um, and of course, at that forum in Margaret River, we had speakers that were speaking on behalf of the anchor industry. And uh, they said that it costs them a lot of money because they are producing the, some of the top quality honey. And my wife and I are also producing honey. But luckily, we are surrounded by our own forest. Uh, and then we have some tobacco farmers around, so we are okay. And we are not like commercial producers, we are just four houses for our own use and few friends. Um, and we produce also high quality honey because it's. Um, because of the nature where we are, um, because we have predominantly carry, we have then quite a jarra, we also have black bug, which is kind of rare uh, these days. Um, and today I've photographed on, on my way to here, I actually stopped with this on the way somewhere and photographed a couple of fantastic black bugs, but then after a few actually. Um, but you can tell they died recently because you can see when you look at our photograph the crown and you can see there are still remnants of leaves there. You can see how tiny little twigs there. When you see a crown of a dead tree, you can generally pinpoint how long ago that tree died. If you only see thick, wide branches, 
you know, I mean, 20 years ago. But when you see tiny little branchlets and you're still running into all these little bit, you know, it was very, very easy. So that was today. So I strongly believe that the current burning methods, now, the extreme and half will do all sorts of things, and then general environment, and of course the, the emissions from it, etc. etc. I just honestly cannot see anything with it. So, the current burning methods have been criticized, not just by me, but many naturalists, many environmentalists, and also Aboriginal elders, but these criticisms have been ignored. There's just one criticism by two Aboriginal elders in that article, so please feel free to take one out of all. They're not enough, I think I only made five copies. I also made a list of plans that you can see, that you can easily find on, on our farm. Uh, or our forest, uh, because our farm, of course, has many different elements. The forest is probably only about one third of it. We have some, some paddocks, we, have, we produce uh, honey, we produce uh, raspberries, we have a small orchard, and I'm uh, um, planting arboretum. Uh, and not just arboretum of trees, but of course, I've some bushes and some other growth in it as well. Um, so, in that forest on our farm, very quickly put it together. There are more, more plants, more diversity than I managed to put on that sheet of paper there. But just to give you a bit of an idea. So unfortunately, after many years, and this and, and another thing that I believe this sort of aggressive, aggressive promotion by uh, burning lobby, uh, that they have brainwashed so many people. As if burning is the only thing we can do for the forest. As if burning is the only solution. As if burning is beneficial for us, for the forest, etc. They produce some sort of almost religion, and people, of course, don't have the time. I'm lucky. I live, I live amongst it, and I see it in my own eyes almost on a daily basis. And I've been taking photographs for almost 30 years, and um, so I, I know quite a bit about it. Um, the people who live in the cities, they don't know. They rely on authorities to tell them, uh, make true, truthful statements and tell them, etc. And unfortunately, what happened, and I've got a few more photographs to show you. Um, what happened? Because the is almost developing some sort of religion that forest must be burned. And people are dumping stuff in the forest. What you see here on this photograph, somebody cut it, not in the forest, but elsewhere, but dumped it in the forest. And here as well. And I know those two people. They are highly regarded people. Um, one of those is working for, I believe it or not, Mangimap Weed Action Group. The stuff that was dumped in the forest was acacia, some acacia, it was not the bata, it was not naloxone, which are the two worst ones. This acacia was annoying this person. This acacia was not self-seeding, wasn't producing uh, settling trees. It was quite happy being there. But even this person wanted it out, because she's obviously some sort of purist. That's fine. Should have been cut into firewood, but of course, with the size of a trunk, with the acacia probably between 30 and 40 centimeters, that could have been offered to some person who is uh, working with wood and some lovely furniture or some lovely craft could have been laid out. Definitely, should not have been cut up into pieces and dumped in the forest. And of course, not only they dumped it in the forest, how against this tree? So when the fire goes through, and I already believe that they will burn it as soon as they can, which will be probably April. When they burn it, that there's a very high likelihood that he will die. Because the fire will be so extreme. And this one is not as bad, but it's pretty bad. There's enough fuel there without adding to it. So this is what happened. The forests have been often a dumping ground for flammable materials. So instead of taking flammable materials out of there, people are just dumping it there. Because 
Sometimes they think it's an easy way of getting rid of it. That's a really quite a boring, I find it quite a boring. And finally, another reason why I'm here today. And I haven't finished it, what am I doing? No, no, I have finished. <laughs> <laughs> so another reason why I'm here today, and I will say quite unashamedly, that uh, I'm determined that the serious change and the totally changed mentality has to occur. I should very much like your support as our plan to lobby governments at all levels for more, and I mean much more, funding in order to repair the problems of the dreadful current practices. The funds are necessary to employ many more people in the forestry, in spite of the fact that logging has now ceased. And of course, logging has been subsidized by the government, so they have money to subsidize log logging, I reckon they should put that money in the repair of the forest. And I just very quickly tell you what I am talking about, and some of you will probably think it's unrealistic, but I think it is realistic because my wife and I, we do it, we just occasionally uh, casual labor. <coughs> this is for our forest again. That's one of, one of the corners, one of the boundaries. When I discovered this corner, obviously I thought, mm, this is too thick. This is not good because nothing, first of all, the plants choke each other a little bit, so they don't grow as well. Uh, secondly, if a fire goes through, it's going to be probably too hot because there's too much fuel there, too much timber, too much burnable, flammable material. So this is what I did. That tree actually had three stems, so this one I removed completely, you can just see the stump. Uh, this Mary was quite 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 sick actually because most of you know there's this uh, fungus that goes through Mary trees these days. So I took it out completely um, and then there were some pebbles which are thin. Now this is the sort of stuff I do all the time in my spare time. I'm still working in my profession. Uh, last year I did a few concerts and I can tell you it was very difficult combining playing piano and and doing this work is very taxing, very difficult. But I don't mind because, as I said, it keeps me fit. And rather than going to gym, I do this. <laughs> Except I do all it sometimes. <laughs> um, that was probably two hours of work for a single person like myself. I don't think it's asking too much. I think it's quite realistic. If we send teams of people into the forest, I think it's quite realistic to achieve it. <coughs> There's another one. This is what it looked like when we bought the farm. Um, and again, I'm struggling to see that the tree needs help because it's a very, very large injury. And if, forest, if fire goes through, it's almost certain that the tree will not make it. So again, I just cleared around the tree. Uh, there were about five or six stems on that, so I just reduced it to three. It can be still reduced to two, but I'm just doing it gradually. I mean, I can take another, another step up later. It's not a big deal. Uh, uh, but just reduce it enough so there is no hot fire inside the tree or in the immediate area around the tree. And that tree could still live as it is, another hundred years, no problem. But if we go in, it will die. There's another section. Like in Margaret River. This is what Margaret River looked like. And we had patches of that as well on our farm. Again, I cleared it. This time, it was no firewood there because they are too small. Maybe you can use them for starters, like starter fires, but um, fire starters. But um, I decided to mulch, produce this beautiful mulch. And it's, it's very easy to mulch because they are long and straight. They have a branch type, they don't have any spikes, etc. Very easy to mulch. And of course, we do need mulch in our uh, little a raspberry orchard, etc. So I turned it again into some good use. And that's what, that was the final result. I haven't finished, I will have a little patch to do that. <laughs> and again, troubling about, this was more time consuming because of the launching. Um, oh, I can't remember, but you're probably about four hours of work for that, for, for a single person. I cut it first, then I marched. Probably about four hours. <coughs> 
And this is what it generally looks like around carry trees. Because carry trees drop quite a bit of bark. Most of that is bark with little branchlets. Those little branchlets probably do not come from the carry tree because carry trees don't have so many little branches. That probably comes from the merry tree which is probably nearby. Um, and again, I rake it away from the tree and we had a bit of a scare recently, like a week ago, a fire came awfully close to us and I'm very happy that I keep my forest not completely free, but largely free and I'll protect some of the main trees at least. Um, and um, uh, we had firefighting pumps and of course we would defend. I don't want to walk away from it. Um, so what I do, I rake away and in winter I burn it, but I burn it on a, on a heap away from the tree and on a small heap where it's going to produce a bit of ash but it's going to cover the whole ground with ash. It's not going to completely wipe out all my insects as, as you saw the photographs of all those beautiful bugs. Uh, uh, one, of, one of my favorite of course is that, uh, that, um, um, that, that large cockroach and I can't think of the name. <laughs> Trollbite, trollbite cockroach. <laughs> you can find it, and I'm with so many. And they are really, almost like pets. And so, uh, to make sure I don't kill these beautiful creatures. And we also have uh, ringtail possums, we also have antecans, and of course we have a lot of bodies there. So I rack it away and use it for fire starters, as fire starters. I sort of compact it a little bit, keep it in my wheelbarrow, compact it a little bit and use it in winter for fire starters. If I have too much of it, I will just burn it on a little heat. And the last photograph I think is coming up now. What happened to it? There should be one more. Obviously someone put it on. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, Ooh, that's a pity. Okay, there was one more pig. We have finished for up in a large area. Not just big little areas like that, but a large area, probably, oh, let's say probably one hectare, basically finished. And you would see on that, it's nice and clean, and on that you would also see there were about three patches of ash in that area where I was doing the burning. And there's still a bit of smoke coming out from one of them. Thank you, that's it.